I'm Kelly Kramer. Welcome to Northeast Iowa and our fall episode of Iowa Outdoors. Coming up on our autumn edition of Iowa Outdoors, we'll venture out after sunset for a stargazing expedition in one of Iowa's darkest counties. Dan Wardell shows us how a mobile zoo filled with roaches, spiders, and centipedes is bringing the outdoors indoors. We venture to Northeast Iowa to explore the beautiful vistas and water trails at the Mines of Spain. And we'll follow the journey of our avian friends from their most vulnerable moments to their reintroduction into the wild and the rehab process along the way. We'll have all that and more, so sit tight. Iowa Outdoors is about to begin. Funding for Iowa Outdoors was provided through a REAP Conservation Education Program grant. Up to $350,000 are available annually to support educational projects about Iowa's natural resources. Information is available at www.iowadnr.gov. By Musco Lighting, the sports lighting specialist, providing lighting systems for you, your project, and your community. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Welcome to Northeast Iowa and the Mines of Spain, a stretch of dramatic bluffs and valleys along the Mississippi River near Iowa's original settlement, Dubuque. In just a few minutes, we'll show you more of this one-time mineral oasis turned outdoor environmental destination. But first, we'll head to one of the darkest regions of our state, at White Rock Conservancy near Coon Rapids. Amateur astronomers from across Iowa and neighboring states gather each year for the Iowa Star Party. It's a weekend full of stargazing, astrophotography, and conversation at the legendary Garst Farm. And for one night, a chance to share an interstellar hobby with curious guests. It's a hot, late summer afternoon, and amateur astronomers are setting up their telescopes in an empty pasture known as the Star Field at White Rock Conservancy. The skies are clear, and there's a long night of good stargazing ahead. Tonight we'll be able to probably look at Saturn for a little while before it gets behind the trees, and you just love that moment of, oh, wow, <laughs> you can see the rings. You hear that over and over, you never get tired of hearing that. First time you see Saturn is a memorable experience with everybody. For many of the participants, observing the universe is a hobby and a passion. It's a treasure hunt in the sky. Lots of different things you can do. Some just like to look, some like to take notes, some like to take pictures. Uh, it's a wide, wide gamut. The telescopes range from small to large, simple to complex, homemade and reasonably priced to very expensive. Some are ideal for looking at stars and planets. Others are designed for viewing galaxies and nebula. For beginners, you can even get started with a pair of binoculars. The light bounces off the big mirror and it comes up to the secondary mirror. One night each year, the public is invited to the Iowa Star Party. People young and old get a basic lesson in Astronomy 101 and learn how to use a star chart. Then, once it gets dark, they have the chance to walk around the star field look through the many different telescopes, and explore the wonders of the skies in new ways. The amateur astronomers are on hand to help guide the viewing and answer any questions. We're actually looking at light that uh, is, uh, left there about 40 minutes ago. It's, it's over a billion miles away right now. And you know when it gets darker, there are some beautiful deep sky, some clusters and galaxies we would love to show you. White Rock Conservancy is an ideal location because there's very little light pollution from nearby towns or cities. A darker sky means better viewing. 
Astronomers can see things here that they could never see from their own backyard in a city. So many people now live in places where you can't even see the sky. And it's, it's not a big tragedy compared to other things that are happening in the world, but it is a loss of beauty, and that's a shame. You see it? And that's something now. Now look out to, uh, from the, to the left of the ring, about four or five diameters from the ring, you'll see a faint speck of light. That's its largest moon, Titan, which is bigger than our moon, actually. But it could be up to a million stars in that ball. They're all swarming around each other like a hive of bees just spinning around. Uh, you see the different galaxies way off in the distance, and you just can't imagine what, you know, you don't know if there's life out there or what's going on out there, but that's kind of neat to see the distant galaxies. That little telescope's in there, I gotta be able to look through just to find Polaris. That's cool. <laughs> it's the beauty of the sky. I've always loved it since I was a kid. And I've gone through the visual observing. I've had a number of telescopes. I just love to look at the sky and the things in the sky. And now I've moved on to a new phase of it, imaging. It's expensive. It's frustrating. But when it works, it's so much fun. I love it. Astrophotography, the art of photographing the skies, is growing in popularity. Amateur astronomers spend hours and hours capturing still images that wow with beauty, grandeur, and artistry. No, actually, I got into astronomy, and astronomy got me into photography. I saw, you know, all the great images and said, wow, I want to do that, so. So I do more of the wide field stuff, um, where I'll actually have my camera with a regular lens just piggybacking on the telescope. A lot of the other guys do what's called prime focus, where they'll have the camera hooked onto where the eyepiece normally goes and you're using the telescope itself as the lens. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but what I usually do is uh, I use a digital uh, DSLR, uh, Canon uh, 450D. I've advanced a little, that's why there's two scopes here. Normally I have my guide scope on this side, and this one tracks the stars. It's got a camera that goes to the computer and there's software that can lock onto a star and make sure if that star starts to drift in any direction, it'll send commands to the mount and tell the mount to compensate for that and keep the stars centered. Meanwhile, the, uh, the digital cameras here taking the pictures, usually I take five or 10 minute uh, sub images. And then at the end of a uh, couple hours of, of that, I'll take all those images and then in, in software, I can add them together. With a good eye and the right technique, the stunning work of amateur astrophotographers rivals what some professionals produce. From the sun to other stars and star clusters, planets like Saturn and Jupiter, and even galaxies. The experience is eye-opening and awe-inspiring. A new group of budding amateur astronomers is hooked by the curiosity of what is out there in the universe. Everybody has a little bit different story to tell about what their interest is, and it's kind of neat seeing that. I like how it looks so different on Earth, and it looks really different when you're looking through a telescope in space. Something that I think everybody should experience just once because it is huge out there, and we have to look beyond just us. There are several amateur astronomy clubs and associations all across Iowa. Some have their own observatories, and many of them host regular public viewing opportunities. If you're interested in stargazing, it's a good way to get involved and continue learning. The best thing you can have as a beginning astronomer is a friend. <laughs> This may not look like Spanish soil, but a little more than 200 years ago, it was just that. Around 1788, a French Canadian with a now famous name had just arrived to settle along these bluffs. His name was Julian Dubuque. In 1796, eight years after Julian Dubuque became the first European settler to set up shop on Iowa soil, a Spanish governor all the way down the Mississippi River in New Orleans 
approved a grant to work this land and its multitude of mineral deposits. For many Americans, the element lead symbolizes an industrial poison long ago removed from our gasoline and household painting supplies. But lead was once the economic engine that revved Dubuque into existence in the late 18th century. This northeastern mining town was known for its lead deposits in the decades prior to the California gold rush of the mid-19th century. But other minerals would steer business and industry to Dubuque for another 80 years. Zinc became another key element extracted from the river bluffs. Julian Dubuque died in 1810, and his remains were buried in a log mausoleum on this site. Nearly 90 years later, a new landmark was created, the Julian Dubuque Monument in 1897. It still towers above the mines of Spain, and it still contains the remains of Iowa's first European settler. In 2012, local historical groups commissioned a forensic artist to reconstruct a visual image of Julian Dubuque. Using facial restoration technology and multiple photos of Dubuque's skull, a digital representation was created. This towering turret known as the Julian Dubuque Monument is a reminder of his legacy and a visual guide to the region. From this vantage point, you'll see barges drifting down the Mississippi River the states of Illinois and Wisconsin in the distance, and the city of Dubuque upstream. Evidence suggests Native Americans inhabited this region 8,000 years ago. Meskwaki Indians once made this waterway their home. Their village was located at the mouth of Catfish Creek, an ideal spot for fur trading with French voyagers. Flash forward 230 years, and Catfish Creek is a training ground for young paddlers. Uh, this is what's called the LEAP program. It's an after-school program for middle school uh, students here in Dubuque. So your life jacket should stay on at all times. Make sure that every buckle is fastened. Like today, we're doing, taking them out canoeing. Uh, we'll do, go snowshoeing this winter. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we were just we we're down at the wetland uh, doing some seining and just trying to, you know, catch some frogs and, and things like that. It's, it's to get them out in nature. If for some reason, you do go over, we will have a throwable that looks like kind of a cushion. That is not a cushion. You're gonna throw it out to the person who's in the water, okay? Catfish Creek is not that deep and we should be all good. Okay, I want you to sit, down, both of you to sit down on the dock and put your feet in the canoe. Go ahead and get in. And for some of them, uh, this is really the first time they've ever, you know, like been in a canoe today. It's more important to get the kids outdoors, get them away from the computer, the TV, and just even if they're in their own backyard, they're out, they're outdoors and they're you know being more active than, than just sitting. Between TV, video games, and iPads, more kids are spending less time outdoors and less time enjoying outdoor creatures. But as Dan Wardell discovered, Iowa State University's traveling insect zoo brings cockroaches, spiders, and a little bit of everything straight to the classroom. It's really special that he can, isn't that cool? Here's his next behavior. If I try to pick him up by his head, what does he do? So you think he's trying to get away from me? Yeah. Yes. And Malachi. And Malachi. Now tell me this. Why do you Jenny Morgel is the energetic entomologist who coordinates Iowa State University's traveling insect zoo. She carries a collection of critters into classrooms to give kids a hands-on lesson about arthropods and why they play important roles in our environment. So today you guys are gonna get to be an entomologist. And you might fall in love with bugs like I did when I was in second grade. I love bugs. They are super awesome. Okay. Yeah, this is what it looks like. The general thought about bugs is that they're gross, they're creepy, they, you know, we should kill them, we should get rid of them. And I want them to take a step back and to look at, you know, how cool they are and, you know, their importance in the world and, and that we can't live without them. Now your first job when you get the millipedes is to find the head, and your next job is to count the legs. Inside those black dots are little tiny holes that it breathes through. 
You're obviously a very animated presenter. The kids love you, but you get a lot back from the kids too. Yeah, I feed off of their energy. I actually, I love it whenever the kids are saying, ew, gross, ew, you know, I, I love that because then it's like, oh, now I'm challenged. So let's see how excited I can get them. Who wants to hold it? Not me. Not me. I'll help you, you wanna hold it, Grace? Hey, we'll do this one. Why don't you put your hand right here on mine and then we'll do it together. Oh. Oh. So tell us how the whole turn the TVs off and go outside and play and explore nature, how does this all fit in? Well, because I'm bringing the outside into them and you know, it seems that more and more kids are not spending a lot of time outside, especially in, in um, urban areas. It gives the kids a chance to see something that they would normally not see and then become familiar with it and even comfortable with it. And perhaps then that will encourage them to, instead of hanging out inside, you know, to go outside and to see what's, what's out there. Just getting in touch with nature, you know, I think it's very important that, that we are doing that. Now, if we first look at the emperor scorpion in my right hand, you will see it has a very big tail on the end, doesn't it? And at the end of that tail is a stinger. Tell us about Rosie. So Rosie is a Chilean rose hair, and um, she comes from Chile, which is in South America. And Rosie's been with the zoo um, for about 10 years. She's about 10 years old. And um, she's just very docile. Now what is that right there? Web. That is her web, that's right. My favorite bug was the tarantula, because I never touched a tarantula before. It was my first time. And I never, ever saw a tarantula before. Now what did you learn about the three parts of an insect? Do you remember what those were? I already know. What, what head, are the, thorax, abdomen. What are the three parts again? Head, thorax, abdomen. How do you know if you've had success in your programs? Well, I gauge that by the reaction of the kids. When kids are seeing something for real and they're touching it and they have all these emotions, you know, they have fear, they have excitement, they have, you know, whatever else they're feeling, spark something else in their brain and they're going to retain that information more, I think. They're going to they're gonna hold on to that and it's gonna be a memory that they have for the rest of their life. I think that will encourage them to learn more about it. The Insect Zoo travels all across the state educating thousands of Iowans each year. Maybe a few of them will want to become entomologists someday. If you'd like to learn more about the program, go to our website, iptv.org slash Iowa Outdoors. What do a peregrine falcon with a broken wing and a red-tailed hawk with only one functional eye have in common? Both are birds of prey, and they're receiving much needed medical attention at Saving Our Avian Resources, or SOAR. This tale is a journey of rehabilitation and reconnection with nature for both birds and humans alike. According to some experts, an eagle has around a 50-50 chance of surviving its first year of life in the wild. In the spring of 2013, it looked as if a pair of eaglets in central Iowa would be on the wrong side of that statistic. The nest they called home had been built in a dead tree in the shallows of a small lake. It is believed that high winds caused the tree to topple, putting both young birds in the water. Only one of the two eaglets survived the disaster, but was still in peril. It is difficult to see any animal in distress, but because an injured wild animal can still be dangerous, rescue should only be attempted by persons with training. As a retired conservation officer, John Mertz had been involved in many such situations. So I kind of got to an upwind side of, there's a little bit of a breeze, and just drifted towards the log where the eagle was uh, without trying to use my paddle or anything. Uh, tried to use a, a Carhartt to get on top of the bird and uh, he escaped. Did a little breaststroke to another log and got up on it. So I uh, backed out of there, came into him again and just went ahead and grabbed him with, by my hands. It's preferable to leave a young animal in its home with its parents, but when the home has been destroyed, the question is, will the adults still be able to care for their babies? Even though the parents were still providing some food to the surviving eaglet, it was determined that the young raptor would perish if action wasn't taken. 
It's really hard to tell, but it looks like we've got a small wing issue on the right wing. Um, it's still a little bit hungry. You know, there's just a, an issue there with trauma, and it will have a better chance going with us today than it does staying here. From its destroyed nest at Rock Creek State Park, the eaglet was transported 120 miles to what everyone hoped would only be a temporary home. Diversity Farms, which is south of Carroll, is the headquarters for SOAR, an acronym for Saving Our Avian Resources. We're really not um, circumventing Mother Nature by, by trying to, uh, to fix these guys. Usually what we see, the injuries are, are some, somehow human related. They're hit by car, they run into a window, they get tangled up in a barbed wire fence. And so 95% of the things that come in are, are related to some sort of human interaction. While it's always the goal to return an animal to the wild, some injuries are so severe that a bird's only hope is to live the rest of its life in captivity. There are around 12 birds that have become permanent residents at SOAR. There's the snowy owl with a wing that didn't mend, the kestrel with a lack of fear after imprinting on humans, and an eagle blinded from lead poisoning. Last year, 2012, uh, we took in 49 bald eagles. If we were seeing 49 bald eagles, and they all had a random assortment of problems, broken leg, a poke in the eye, a broken wing, you know, just a hodgepodge of things, I wouldn't be worried. But when 32 of those came to us because of ingested lead, then that's a problem. Only 200 milligrams of lead, or a piece about the size of a grain of rice, can kill an eagle. Lead ulcerates the stomach, damages the kidney and liver, and will cause the brain to swell. In Thora's case, the swelling caused damage to the optic nerve, which has impaired her vision. Poisoning is completely preventable. This is an easily prevented sort of thing that is happening. All we need to do is have hunters switch from lead ammunition to non-lead non ammunition. They make non-toxic shot, copper bullets, copper slugs. Right now we have over 260 eagles in our database over 60% of those are there because of lead poisoning. The facilities at SOAR include an intensive care area where birds are treated for their life-threatening injuries. The building is also divided into 17 flight pens where a bird can recover from its injuries and exercise its wings. For a young bird, it also provides an opportunity to learn social skills from older birds. Jasper, the young eaglet rescued from the lake when his nest was destroyed, suffered a deep muscle bruise. The 100-foot-long flight barn at SOAR was invaluable in helping the young eagle learn to fly as it recovered from its injuries. Five, about four months, maybe three months old. It took three months of rehabilitation before Jasper was ready for freedom. At a special event, he and four other birds from SOAR were released. The honor of returning Jasper to the wild went to John Mertz, the person who had rescued him. The fun part of doing rehabilitation is to be able to give, give these guys a second chance at being wild. And it's, it's fun to involve people um, it's, it's very exciting to be able to hold one. And you, when you're holding them, you can just kind of feel that it's like, I really want to go, I want to fly. And so for you to be able to let them go, it's just fun to be able to give them what they want and let them fly free. That wraps up this fall edition of Iowa Outdoors. You can find any of our more than 60 features covering Iowa's outdoor environments and recreational opportunities online at iptv.org slash Iowa Outdoors. But before you check out what the rest of Iowa has to offer, we'll leave you with some images of autumn along the Mississippi River right here in Northeast Iowa.
Funding for Iowa Outdoors was provided through a REAP Conservation Education Program grant. Up to $350,000 are available annually to support educational projects about Iowa's natural resources. Information is available at www.iowadnr.gov. By Musco Lighting, the sports lighting specialist, providing lighting systems for you, your project, and your community. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on IPTV can be found in Iowa Outdoors magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov.